So general obedience, but then the occasional dog aggression? Um, yeah, so he, um, a couple of things, the leash pulling uh, and the random dog aggression. Okay. Uh, would love to get him off leash train too, but um, more, uh, I mean the number one thing is the random dog aggression, so he, uh, he was a rescue, so he was found on the street and he had been attacked. Okay. So when I first got him, he was afraid of everyone and everything and every noise and every dog. Okay. So we worked on that and got him good with people and dogs. Mm -hmm. And then we were, so much so that we were going to the dog park and he was running and playing and doing all the normal things. Mm -hmm. And then one day, uh, it's kind of like, one of the dogs, you know, was annoying him. <laughs> he like, wouldn't leave him alone, like trying to play, and he didn't, he kind of would do the like, hey, leave me alone. Sure, just snap or whatever, sure. But I hadn't seen it before. I was like, okay, it's, it was enough to kind of um, raise awareness. And then we went, and then it was normal, and then it happened again, but it seemed more aggressive. And I was like, that's very strange. And then I hurt my foot and he got neutered, so we didn't go to the dog park for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And then when we went back, it was almost like he picked up where he left off and it was a little bit more aggressive. Okay. Nothing happened, but it was like, why is this, something's off here. Mm -hmm. And then I took him to, for a walk in the park and there was a dog and they were like pouncing, playing, little puppy and I don't know, something happened and he snapped and he like grabbed the puppy by the neck and was like going for it. Mm -hmm. And then I got really scared, like oh, what is triggering this? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's random and other dog, I mean other dogs he sees on the street and he's fine. My parents have dogs, he goes and plays with them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what it was um, that triggered it, but I don't take him to the dog park because I'm afraid. So then I feel bad because he's not running and playing and you know, being social. Mm -hmm. uh, the puppy one, I, they were in, they were playing and then it's it, he just snapped. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how many instances? It sounds like three. Uh, yeah, yeah. The first first two were like uh, kind of nothing, something. The last one was bad. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, with the, did it look bad or like, did he puncture? Uh, with the puppy, the mm. last one, it was bad, yeah. Okay. I mean, he the actually... puppy was okay. Like afterwards, I obviously followed up with the owner and stuff and she's like, the puppy's fine, you know, he's fine. And it was, it was okay, but it was serious. I mean, he had him like. Okay, but there was no like punctures or blood or broken skin? No, I don't know. Okay. Because it can look worse than it is. Got it. Right, so that's, that's always, because clearly he had the opportunity to, mm -hmm. but he didn't. Mm -hmm. So that's so those are all things that we factor in. Mm -hmm. um, the prom collar, um, when did that come in? Uh, within the last month. <laughs> uh, within the last month, because mm -hmm. the pulling, so the leash pulling, um, he was fine, and then we do like a, you know, if we're just doing our usual business, we do a loop around. Mm -hmm. And he, he he loves being home, he loves going home. And when we would turn the corner like to go home, mm -hmm. he would just start pulling me so bad, I could barely walk him. And then I just started getting frustrated and like sometimes I would just pick him up because I it, like hurt my body mm -hmm. and he was just pulling so hard I couldn't stop him. Sure. So this has helped a lot. Uh -huh. Um, but I also don't love it either and would prefer, you know, to just not get pulled and not have that be a thing. But we'll go on long walks, long normal walks, and he's fine. Mm -hmm. It's just more like once he turns, once he knows we're going home, back, yeah. he's like pull, dragging me home. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, how long have you had him for? Uh, over a year. Okay, so COVID dog. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, he was my foster dog. Gotcha. <laughs> and how old is he? 
He is a year in February, so a year and four months. Okay. Uh, on the leash, do, do you get reactivity like I saw outside, or is that more so just with being surprised? Um, when he gets surprised, yeah. Generally, he's okay, but like coming in and out of weird buildings, weird people like that. Mm -hmm. um, generally, honestly, when we when we walk and he sees, like a lot of people will say, you know, can I pet him or I have another dog, you know, another dog wants to play. Mm -hmm. He like is so oblivious. Like mm -hmm. he doesn't um, stop or sniff. He's just like. Yeah, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. kind of ignores it. Okay. Yeah. Um, have you noticed his anxiety? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. when do you notice his anxiety? Um, at home, if I have, like, the window open and he hears every noise, mm -hmm. he just can't, like, Relax. settle. Yeah. Um, when we walk, uh, the anxiety... Again, when we turn the corner and he wants to go home. Yeah, that's what I, I, I was picking up on yeah. on the way home. Yep. Um, has this always been just kind of his thing, or that you've noticed, or is this like over time you see him kind of become like this? The anxiety. Yeah, the anxiety, and like the nervous response. That's a nervous response. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever something um, kind of happens out the blue, um, so nervousness, fear, and, and uh, anxiety look similar, uh, but they have like defining things. Mm -hmm. Fear uh, doesn't let things go. Like they'll be barking and they'll keep barking. Mm -hmm. and they won't relax. Uh, anxious energy will keep pacing. Like, so he's not barking at me, but he's just sniffing around, he's unable to settle, he's not laying down, he's not sitting. He'll go over there and stare, and then he'll come over here and move over here, and he's moving over here, right? He's unable to just, just relax. And nervousness will relax, but then when something suddenly changes, they'll trigger, and then they'll bark. And then, like, let's say if I stood up and clapped, he might bark. That's a nervous response. But then if I go and sit down and relax, after a few minutes, he'll relax. But then if I get up and clap again, he'll bark. So that's nervous energy. So you got a mix of the two, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, when it comes to the stuff at the dog park with the three instances, um, percentage-wise, the times that you've gone to the dog park, how many would you say where it's like, was it like 97% of the time it's been great and it was just mm -hmm. those 3%, those with each instance that you had a moment? Yeah, I mean, we were going a couple months every other day. Okay. And he was having a blast, mm -hmm. and then it was like that one little time, and then a little more, and then a lot, and then it was like, okay, I can't risk it. Like that thing with the puppy kind of traumatized me. Sure. I was like, yeah. I don't know where this is going next, mm -hmm. and I can't let it get worse. So yeah, um, he was doing great. Uh, he started. I mean, when I first got him, he was afraid and couldn't play with other dogs and mm -hmm. then I um, had some other like dog friends and we got him socialized mm -hmm. and it was yeah it was like was he reverting back to that as something triggered him because he got attacked I don't know but it was fine for a couple months and then the last um, you know couple times it's just worse yeah so when it comes to the the dog aggression, uh, super common that a dog will have a negative experience and quote unquote be like traumatized. Mm -hmm. uh, typically happens around six months in a year. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll get a lot of clients that they'll have a puppy who's completely social and then like around six months they'll get attacked by a dog at the dog park 
and then like the next day, they hate dogs. Mm -hmm. Usually six months of the year, because those are very pivotal uh, times in a dog's life where they have a psychological shift. So six months is what I call terrible two's brain, uh, teenager body. Uh, a year is teenager brain, adult body, and then two years is adult dog. Okay, so six months in a year, super common. Something happens around that time frame, and then it causes behavioral issues. Uh, it can also happen anytime in the in between, but more often than not, it's usually around these two times. Okay, so what happens is the dog's like quote unquote traumatized. That's the nervous response. Traumatized. Um, uh, it causes distrust. It causes distrust against towards other dogs. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because dogs don't generalize things unless it be, unless it's something like that. Mm -hmm. So if you teach dogs sit like at home and sit outside, they're like two different things, mm -hmm. okay? But if a dog is attacked by one dog, and then the next day they hate all dogs, mm -hmm. okay? So it's really weird. They don't generalize, but they generalize for certain things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what can also happen is if he had a negative experience like that, and then he's like, well, now I have to be more uh, proactive about uh, what I allow and what I don't allow. Mm -hmm. So the puppy one uh, and the other ones could have been uh, an over escalation, which is when the energy just becomes too much. Mm -hmm. uh, one dog bites too hard during play, and then it just triggers a fight. Mm -hmm. uh, he's under stress and the dog rushes up to him. Um, I mean, it can be any number of things. Uh, and what can seem like aggression can also be a, a correction, okay? So let's say a dog tried to mount him and you turn around and you let her and snap that dog. Mm -hmm. That's a correction. That's not aggression, okay? So it's just like if someone tried to mount me and like, let's fuck off me, <laughs> yeah, right? Same thing for dogs. Yeah. So uh, except for as humans, we can communicate things and say like, hey, back off, you're in my space, or you're talking too close, right? Uh, dogs don't have that. Dogs are all about physicality. Mm -hmm. um, so like, this is a dog bite here in my hand. Um, this is from a great thing, okay? 10 stitches. And this is because he didn't want to go in the kennel. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he's not aggressive. He's a big goof. Um, it, it was his first day here. He was here for a four week board and train. And I was actually just trying to see, was he gonna fit in the kennel? Okay, so I wasn't even trying to put him in, put him in. I was like, are you fit in here? And he was like, no, I'm not going in there. And he bit me. Okay, and he still comes here, and he comes to daycare, he comes to the boarding. He's completely social. Okay, so he wasn't aggressive. He just had never been in a uh, Okay, so, so um, I remember when I talked to the owners about it, they're like, oh my god, we didn't know our dog was aggressive. This and that, like, your dog's not aggressive. Like, your dog was just stressed, never been here before, and did not want to go in the kennel. And his way of telling me was by, you know, biting my hand. Um, and we've not had an issue with him ever since. And he's been coming here for like a year and a half now. So, um, that was a correction uh, to me, even though we might think that this is like severe, mm -hmm. right? In the dog world, like that's completely normal, okay? So when it comes to those moments of, you know, random aggression, uh, I'm picking up more like most likely corrections, but then on one of them, he went overboard, mm -hmm. okay? And that can be just pent up stress finally coming out. It's kind of like with humans, you know, if you get a lot of stuff just kind of on your mind, uh, and then finally you add one more thing, we just like, <laughs> that's enough, right? But as humans, we might scream, we might yell, right? Uh, we don't bite other humans, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in his world, that's the language. Dogs are very mouth based Like right now, like you hear something, he's walking. Right. So go ahead and pull them in, and then you're gonna know, pull up on your on your leash. Pull straight up, 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 up. Uh, pull up with your left hand, and then down with your right. Is he fine with people? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you see all this right here? This is nervousness. Okay. All this posture here. Okay. There we go. Okay. So you see how he, all this here, mm -hmm. okay? This is all insecure. This is all just nervous energy. So here, I just want him to relax and not worry about like what's going on in the outside. Okay, so I'm just hold on to it. So um, when it comes to that stuff, uh, aggression is, is pretty consistent. 
Uh, every time you walk by the dog's bowl, they try to bite you. Uh, every time someone comes in, they try to bite them. Uh, every time they get near a dog, they try to bite them. Like it's, it's very consistent. Think of aggression as kind of like um, uh, a person with anger management issues, right? They, they blow up uh, to an extreme for even the slightest thing, okay? So similar for dogs. Um, here, I think what's potentially happened is he's kind of lost his way. Uh, you already had a dog with issues from the get-go. You know that you're like, yeah, he wasn't very social. He was kind of scared and very anxious. Uh, and he still is. He's just gotten a bit better because he's gotten some more consistencies from you. Uh, and then, you know, take him to the dog park, uh, you know, socialize him and all that stuff. But then eventually something happened and then it caused, in his mind, like, oh, okay, like, I guess I have to defend myself or be proactive. Because uh, in his world, it's kill or be killed. That's how dogs think, okay? But we don't think that way. You know, so when I get dogs that are like, for instance, leash reactive, you know, I tell the owner, like, for you, you see your neighbor walking your dog, you're like, that's my neighbor walking my dog. Like, but for your dog, your dog's going, that's a potential threat. And I'm gonna put out threat first so that they can't hurt us. Does that make sense? So here, uh, when it comes to his issues, uh, it could just be overstimulation, an overload of stress. Like right now, he's overloaded with stress, okay? And what I'm doing right here, is just adding a bit of structure and control to help kind of taper him down. We can still see how he's still interested, right? Uh, so right now, I'm not telling him to sit, so to speak. I'm telling him to relax. Uh, do you mind if I just clip on his prong? Sure. Okay. Um, and then just should be up here. So these are meant to be fitted up here. I'm assuming you had to fit it to this as a backup. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So prongs are, are, are meant to be fitted on the top here. This gives you the most control. Um, I'm not a huge fan of these um, nylon clip ones. In my opinion, they take out like 80% of the function of the prong. Uh, okay. it, it may be better from what you experienced before with him. Harnesses are meant for pulling. Uh, harness can also uh, escalate stress, okay? So dogs have this thing called opposition reflex. Are you familiar with that? Uh, it's a fancy word. All it means is when dogs feel pressure, they want to go against it, okay? So if you pull back, he pulls more forward. If you pull forward, he pulls back. If you pull left, he pulls right. If you pull right, he pulls left, okay? That's opposition reflex. So harnesses kind of exacerbate that. So a lot of people put a harness on their dog because they don't want them pulling against their throat, right? Which I understand. But then when they put a harness on the dog, it creates that tension. Mm -hmm. And then what can happen is every time you're trying to pull them away from something or direct them with it, you're actually causing tension and stress. Mm -hmm. So then that can start to escalate. And all that has to go somewhere, right? So for him, because he's mouth-based, it can become barking, it can be uh, licking, chewing, panting, um, biting, whining. Uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, dogs are pretty much mouth-based, mm -hmm. okay? So the harness here, in my opinion, uh, you know, if you move forward with training and stuff like that, you don't want to get rid of it. This is going to do you more harm than it does any good. Harnesses are meant for pulling. So like courses were harnesses to pull carriages, but the driver doesn't have the reins on the harness. They have the reins on the bridle, which controls the head. You control the head, you control the body, right? So with the prom collar, very similar. Having it up here allows me to control the head. So by controlling the head, I cannot control the body. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you have an effective tool, like you have a good tool here. It's just um, not fitted correctly and it's not an appropriate style. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to prong collar, I think earlier you mentioned something about uh, what was it you didn't like? You don't like the prong collar or you don't like that he's pulling? Both, yeah, I just wish it was simpler. <laughs> yeah. Simpler how? I don't know, I feel like the prong collar is hurting him or just. I don't know, it feels like it's. Not comfortable for him. Okay, so prong collar looks worse than it is. Because uh, you see this spiky looking thing. Mm -hmm. right? Do you know how a prong collar, where does the, the design comes from? Uh, not really, no. Uh, from Broadway. Dog's teeth. Mm -hmm. Right, because dogs bite each other. Mm -hmm. So the prong collar is actually, one of the, in my book, one of the best tools, the second best, uh, when used correctly. 
It may look evil and menacing because we're humans and that's how we think, um, but really it's a very good line of communication. Uh, it technically allows you to bite your dog, okay? So like, let's say, uh, like right now, someone came in, he lunged at them. I could technically use this to correct them and create a biting motion to tell them, I disagree with what you're doing right now. Now, as humans, we think about pain and hurt, mm -hmm. but dogs don't think that way. This dog didn't think that way, mm -hmm. right? He didn't say like, hey man, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to bite you. <laughs> he also didn't say, hey Jess, you make me feel uncomfortable, please don't put me in that kennel. Yeah. He just said, hey, I'm not going in there, I'm gonna bite you. That was it, okay? So dogs, their language is physicality. As humans, we're taught that physicality is kind of like a last resort, mm -hmm. right? Like don't, don't be violent, uh, handle things through communication and conversation, mm -hmm. which we can, but we also still get into fights, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, but dogs don't have that line of communication like we do. They're not that complex. They're more primal. So he's more inclined to resort to physicality, okay? And this is why a lot of people struggle. People tend to try to train dogs in a manner that a human would understand, and they're not capable of that. I train dogs in a manner that dogs understand, and I make the human, or teach the human, understand how dogs think, okay? So that's why, right now, I went straight to the prong collar, I just adjusted it and I fitted it correctly. And I've just been putting a little bit of pressure on him and using my hands to direct him. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling uh, Milo to sit, mm -hmm. right? I'm telling him to relax. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Sit is obedient. Sit is put your butt down and don't move. Mm -hmm. Relax is, I don't care what you do, sit or lay down or even stand. But don't bark every time you hear a sound. Don't walk around and be anxious, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what he was doing the entire time he had him. And I had him for like five minutes now, and he's super relaxed. And all I've done was give him a little bit of physicality, okay? So physicality doesn't have to be mean. That's what people think, okay? Even if I did pop Milo firmly on the collar here, it doesn't mean I'm being mean. Mean is energy, right? If I'm like, no, stupid dog, ah, that's being, that's adding mean, frustrated, negative energy. But if he flips out and I correct them and I'm completely neutral, that is not being mean, that's just being direct. Okay? Does that make sense? It does, yeah. So when it comes to, to addressing uh, the aggressive responses, um, you have to talk Milo's language and that's where things get complicated. Okay? Because if you're not willing to talk his language with physicality or give him consequence and discipline, that problem's always gonna be there. Okay? So the most common form of training that's accepted or widely accepted is a positive reinforcement, which is food-based training, okay? Food-based training is very good for puppies under six months. It's very good for shaping behaviors. Uh, it can help with, with some counter conditioning things, like if the dog doesn't like taking baths, like mm -hmm. food can help with that. But when it comes to like aggression and like stopping aggressive responses, it doesn't work at all, in my opinion, okay? When it comes to these responses you want, don't want him to do, that's where consequence comes into play, okay? So think of reward or reinforcement or food or, or praise when you want to see something again. So if I say sit and Milo sits, I want to see that again. I would feed him, mm -hmm. right? But let's say Milo gets up and I want to stop him from getting up. That's where consequence comes in, okay? To deter him from getting up. So he thinks if I put my butt down, I get something good. If I get up, I get something bad. So if I just keep my butt down, I can avoid the bad and get something good, okay? So we apply that same kind of theory to uh, behavioral stuff like um, uh, the over-escalation or, or becoming too defensive and becoming aggressive or whatever it is, and I just, I posted a video about this actually on my, on my social media a few months ago, but there was, it's a dog park setting. And one dog corrects another dog but then another dog comes in and corrects the dog that corrected <laughs> the other dog, okay? So by using physicality. Mm -hmm. So essentially, if he acted out negatively, you would have to give him consequence for that behavior. And then he thinks, okay, I can try to go after this puppy, but if I do, mom's gonna spank me, quote unquote, okay? So I was raised old school, I was, raised, I was, beat, I was spanked. Um, so if I didn't do my homework, I got spanked. Uh, if I talked back, I got spanked. Uh, if I didn't do my chores, I got spanked. Uh, if I did something I wasn't supposed to, I got spanked. 
that's pretty much it, right? Um, so aversives can be both motivators uh, and also uh, can also motivate to do things and also stop things, okay? So for him, if, um, if he acts out and there's no real consequence for the behavior that he understands, the behavior is not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So for humans, we have uh, cops, we have uh, laws, uh, we have judges in jails, we also have tickets. Bless you. Uh, we have things like fines and tickets, right? But then if you commit a crime, you might go to jail or prison. Those are consequences for behaviors, right? Uh, jail or prison doesn't matter to him. Getting fined doesn't matter to him. Not getting a piece of chicken doesn't matter to him. What matters to him is if I do something, if something unpleasant is added, do I want to do that behavior again? Okay. So like if he did act up and I corrected him with this prong collar, I'm technically adding in a brief moment of discomfort by biting him with the prong. And he goes, hey, when I try to bark right now, this negative thing happened. When I stopped barking, it went away. And then he barks and I do it again. He's like, oh, my barking happened again. What happens if I don't bark? Nothing. He goes, oh, so if I don't bark at this stimuli, I can avoid the correction. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then he makes his decisions based off of that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, before booking this, did you do any research on how I trained and the methods that I used? I looked at the website and yes, I don't remember that, but yes. Okay. <laughs> so I do use prong collar. Okay. Uh, however, um, it's more I incorporate it. I don't really use it as a primary tool of training because uh, it takes a lot of technical skill. Mm -hmm. um, you have to know how to correct correctly. Mm -hmm. um, um, people tend not to like the physicality component of having to pull the leash and yank their dog in order to stop a behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, so prong collar is more of something I incorporate. Uh, like for instance, I had a, a young lady who was probably like 90 or 100 pounds and she had a 150 pound rating. thing. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so she did both prong collar and e-collar. Okay, because her dog would literally drag her across the street. So she needed as much leverage as possible. Uh, we just had a gentleman, I trained his daughter's dog and then he brought his dog to get trained by us. Uh, he's like 78 years old and he has a 100 pound German Shepherd who is both human and dog reactive. Okay, and can bring him down very quickly and easily. So that dog is also like prong and e-collar because I'm trying to compensate for kind of that, that, that difference. Um, but for the most part, I train all my dogs on e-collar, okay? Are you familiar with what e-collar is? Kind of, sort of. It's like the buzz collar. Sure. So some people call it like a shock collar. Shock, would, uh, in my opinion, is an incorrect term. The shock implies you're electrocuting your dog. Uh, that's not what an e-collar is, okay? It's not electrocution. If it was electrocution, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be a dog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, e-collar is essentially what uh, is a miniaturized TENS unit. Are you familiar with TENS units? Have you ever been to a chiropractor or physical therapist? Have you ever seen those videos where they recreate labor contraction pains in men? Yes. Okay, that's an e-collar. Okay. okay. So obviously labor contraction pains are painful, right? Uh, so they have to go to an extreme to recreate that in mm -hmm. men. But uh, what it is is a, is a muscle stimulator, okay? So there's this thing called a TENS unit where it's like these little circles and they put them on your arm, for example, and when they turn the, the, the machine on, it moves your muscles. So if you've ever seen like infomercials for like the workout reacts as you watch TV thing, <laughs> it's the same technology. Okay, so it's a muscle stimulator. But when people think electric, they think electrocution. Okay, so it's the same technology, it's just muscle movement, uh, it's muscle contraction. Uh, and the reason why I use this tool is because right off the bat, you get off leash control. Okay, uh, two, it's very, um, uh, common sense and logic based, the way that I teach it at least. Uh, it allows you to correct his behaviors even if he's off the leash. So like if you're at the park and he's looking tense, mm -hmm. you can stop him even if you're 20 feet away. Mm -hmm. And you can prevent the behavior from even escalating. Uh, here at my facility, you know, we, we do smaller groups of uh, play so that we can control things. So one of the problems is, if we think of energy as one through 10, a lot of times when dogs get to five to six is when scuffles start to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like growing up um, when kids would play too rough mm -hmm. and then it would escalate into like a pushing fight or like a fist fight, right? They start off playful, yeah. 
but then someone pushed too hard or someone did something too rough and all of a sudden we have a fight. It's the same thing for dogs, okay? So we have some dogs who have issues with like um, escalation and we can de-escalate them using the collar so that they never get to that five to six threshold so we don't see the you know outburst like you've seen with this guy, okay? The other thing is, let's say he, for whatever reason, he did somehow get find himself in that situation. Pulling him away from that situation can be dangerous, dangerous both to whoever's pulling him away and the dog you're pulling him away from. Because if it is an intensity um, and you just reach in, we get what we call redirected aggression. And if he's so kind of lost in the moment that when you when you jump in, he doesn't know and he just bites. Okay, and that, that's happened to a number of clients over the years. Or when you're trying to pull their dog away, he doesn't want to lose um, the I don't want to like the grip that they'll uh, bite even harder. And the next thing you know, you're ripping tissue. Okay, and that actually happened. Uh, a client uh, told me about a, a great thing that attacked a dachshund, and they pulled a great thing off and it pulled off the dachshund's back. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So. By pulling the dog away from a fight, you can potentially make things much, much worse than they actually are, okay? With the remote collar, uh, it gives you the ability to disengage him uh, without any real risk to, to yourself or the other dog because he has to consciously decide to remove himself, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so like I had a client, her dog was social, uh, they were at Oz Park, she was playing fetch, and some random dog uh, went after her dog's ball at the same time her dog was getting to it and then triggered into a dog fight. Mm -hmm. uh, so then she had to max out the collar, but she was able to return her dog within like a half second mm -hmm. and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. You know, her dog yelped because of the intensity, uh, but I told her it was either that or you risked there would have been a, a worse fight, mm -hmm. or if you would have gone in yourself, you could have gone in yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, but the idea here is that we don't even get there in terms of the, um, the escalation, all that stuff because you're being more proactive about not allowing them to get to that mindset. Um, questions so far about any of that stuff? Um, yeah, the, um, the prom color that you mentioned, mm -hmm. so if I'm walking, I mean, if I get it like fitted right and get the right one and all the things, I mean, some, more often than not anymore, there's moments where even with the collar when we're headed home. Like he does better, but then there's like yeah. that moment where it's like he doesn't seem to matter that he's choking himself or you know, whatever you know, the prone collar is doing. Mm -hmm. So if it were fitted right and the right one, is he still gonna just pull through it or? But I wouldn't do prong. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Prong is, uh, even if you got the correct one, yeah. it's too skill-based. Oh, okay, so you're saying instead of prong, I would do Remote. the e-collar. Oh, Correct, yeah. I thought it was like different scenarios for different things. Got it. Yeah, so your dog, uh, so I primarily train with e-collar. Okay. Every now and then I incorporate prong collar. Okay, so we would go with the e-collar. Correct, yeah. And then it would help with the polling too? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then um, with the socialization, is that something that we would like in your small group here we would try it out or like where would you start with that so if socialization is something you're wanting to accomplish with them mm -hmm. uh you have to muzzle condition them muzzle them, yeah. correct because if we did it here by daycare i put my dogs at risk right mm -hmm. if we did it with your friend's dog we put that dog at risk if we go to the dog park yeah so that was the part i was worried about is mm -hmm. like it seems like um, because I don't know which way it's going to go. Correct. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, the other thing is, and you're not me. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this for over 10 years now. Um, aggression is my specialty. Um, I can read dog behavior very well. And it's kind of having to catch you up, mm -hmm. right, with all the stuff that you would need to know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's like a bunch of variables here. So he doesn't need the dog bark. He doesn't need the dog bark? Mm -hmm. He doesn't, he doesn't think about that. Okay. He doesn't think and go, man, I wish I would have behaved myself because I could have stayed at the dog park longer. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I like that he's playing with other dogs and running. He's a runner. He wants to run and sure. play. Sure. But that makes you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But he doesn't need it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, 
the reason why I say that is dog park, and if that's one of your goals, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But dog park comes with a lot of variables. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you you can't control other dogs. Well, let's say he's being, let's say you do all the work right and he's great, but then another dog attacks him again, mm -hmm. and then you have a problem again, right? Because it's created this trust. Mm -hmm. Because technically, in his mind, you're supposed to handle that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like when I get clients who they'll be walking their dog just on the street and they're charged by an off-leash dog and literally the next day their dog is dog reactive. And they're like, Jesse, why? I'm like, because the dogs lost trust in you. They got charged by an off-leash dog, you didn't handle it, they had to handle it, so then they leave the next day going, you know what, I'm not gonna let that happen again, right? Um, so dog parks, a lot of variables. Um, the intensity, like you can control his intensity, but what if the other dog keeps coming at him? Mm -hmm. And then at some point he's like, hey, mom told me to be calmer, but you're not stopping, so I'm gonna have to address you anyways. Mm -hmm. You know, it gets kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you're socializing with dogs that you know and you are very familiar with, like, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, if he was going to the dog park before and he was fine, it was just three instances. Mm -hmm. That's why I asked earlier, like, what was the percentage? You're like, well, you score with like every other day. Yeah. So chances are you're, his behavior is going to, uh, in terms of the the reactivity stuff or the escalated behavior, uh, would be much more minimal. But doesn't mean it won't happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So aggression or aggressive responses aren't things that dogs are born with or without. Okay. That's like I think it's interesting because humans will say like, "Oh, is your dog? You know, my dog's friendly. They're not aggressive." Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't describe our friends that way. This is my friend, he's very friendly, he's not aggressive. Because <laughs> yeah. any human is capable of becoming aggressive, right? It's just a matter of, are they put in a situation that they feel they need to? Mm -hmm. So think of aggression as anger. So if someone said like, you know, uh, uh, I can make it so you'll never get angry again, would you believe them? No. No, right? Because there's so many variables. And the same thing for dogs, that when it comes to the aggression, just think of it as an escalated form of anger, mm -hmm. right? So it can always happen. It's just, is he put in a situation where he feels he needs to? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, are you being proactive about making sure he doesn't get to that point or not putting him in a situation where he may need or he may feel that he needs to be? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So like if I, get a, if I have a dog that um, doesn't like to be touched by people, right? And then uh, the owner uh, puts him in a situation with having a, a stranger just pet them. Like obviously there's gonna be something there because they're, they're pushing that stressor, right? We can do all the work in the world to teach the dog not to bite people, but if put in that situation, that dog still technically has that option. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I don't think you have an aggressive dog, okay? I think you have a dog that's lost himself mm -hmm. um, and he's got some, uh, some distrust issues, not as bad as other dogs, mm -hmm. but in situations where he feels threatened or something happens, he's thinking, I gotta go there. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the theory here with how we would approach this is we also have that anxiety issue and the nervous stuff, mm -hmm. okay? We gotta kind of um, get that under control too. And I can't make him unanxious and unnervous, mm -hmm. but we can teach him how to handle it better. Mm -hmm. And then I teach you how to handle an anxious or nervous dog, mm -hmm. okay? So like earlier, anxious, here, mm -hmm. calming down. And he's growled a couple of times, but each time I've addressed him, right, very easily and sim uh, simply. Uh, but I'm getting this response. Does it make sense? So this here is more technical. It may not seem technical, but it, it's a lot of feedback in terms of physicality and me putting my hands on him and using prong pressure and knowing when to relax once I've gotten the result that I wanted. And because he, I'm talking his language, I can achieve this very easily. Okay, um, but you're not me, mm -hmm. right? So then that's where tools like the remote collar come into play because it allows you to discipline him at the press of a button. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy for you to learn and very easy for you to replicate and it's something that is meant to be functional. Mm -hmm. So sit, stay, down, come, place, heel, six commands. Mm -hmm. They're all meant to be functional. They're meant for you to do more things with your dog. They're meant for you to, uh, to live your life with your dog. So heel is what will allow you to walk to and from home without any pulling, mm -hmm. okay? I don't care if, if he's anxious or nervous, whatever, he still has to hold the positioning, okay? The e-collar can override that. Mm -hmm. If we try to do prong, 
if his anxiety to go home is at a 20 and you're correcting him on the prong collar and you're doing a good correction but the most you can do is a 10 10 is never going to match 20 mm -hmm. right remote collar can match a dog and override them because it's at the press of a button mm -hmm. okay and the collars that we use have 127 settings uh, so it's very fine-tuned old school e-collars only had like three to five settings mm -hmm. so you know five and 127 are the same i just have 122 more divisions now Okay, so I can really fine tune it. Whereas before, three, your dog might be yelping, two, your dog wouldn't listen. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're kind of stuck. Uh, with today's e-collars, they're much more refined. You don't really worry about that, okay? Um, so the first thing you do with a guy like this is teach him how to walk correctly on a leash. Um, the discipline from the e-collar can help resolve like 70 to 80% of problems, okay? And that's why it's almost always the first thing that we teach. Leash pulling is also one of the most common things that people want to fix. Uh, leash reactivity is one of the most common things that I deal with as a dog trainer and the healing exercise helps address both those issues plus so much more okay so once he gets discipline in his head and it's also very it's not confrontational he doesn't know where it's coming from he just knows that there's discipline involved it is discipline changes how a dog thinks so for me growing up um, when mom, my mom said I don't do that and I hadn't been spanked before it was just don't do that and then I got spanked for the first time now don't do that has a totally different meaning, mm -hmm. right? Because now I'm thinking like, wow, like if mom says not to do something, there's more to it. Do I really want to perform this behavior, mm -hmm. right? So same thing for dogs. Once he starts to get a sense of discipline, now he starts to think like, okay, like there's this thing and it exists. I don't like it. And if I make certain decisions, it'll happen. Is we see how does that alter his behavior, okay? And it's not gonna make him a robot. You're not gonna lose your dog's personality or anything like that. He's just going to be a disciplined dog when he's put under command and he's going to make different choices accordingly. Okay. So we see what does the heel fix? That's typically two classes. Class one, I coach you through it. Um, I give you your homework. You come back class two. How are we doing? Hey, Jesse, for the most part, we can walk home, no pulling. A lot of progress there. It looked great. We're going to make a couple of changes. Tweak some things. Here's the second half of heel. Go off and do your homework. Come back for class three. How are we doing? Even better. Awesome, right? You want to always be making progress. Uh, by class three, if you're wanting to socialize him, um, there's a couple ways about it. One is I teach you how to socialize him correctly, which would be like, let's say it's a friend's dog, a family member's dog, you know, a dog, a neighbor's dog, a dog you would see on a regular basis. That's easier for him because it's a dog you would see on a regular basis uh, that he can develop like a friendship with uh, that's more controlled. And we're not worried about is he going to escalate now can he still escalate yes but knowing that dog and that dog's consistency with their behavior makes it easier for you and him okay if you're trying to do dog park setting there's no real correct way of bringing a dog into a dog park because if you go to a dog park they tend to charge the gate okay that's actually a big no-no in the dog world that's why a lot of times dog fights will happen coming into the dog park because the dog feels overwhelmed because they just see all these dogs in their face for him, the, the times that it happened, mm -hmm. it was like within the first five minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So that's why here at daycare, if we bring the dog into the playpen, we back the dogs away mm -hmm. so the dog can enter in safely and not feel mm -hmm. overwhelmed. Okay? So uh, obviously, you're not going to be able to do that because those aren't your dogs, mm -hmm. right? So if you brought him into the dog park and we find he's going under stress and he's going using flight response, he's trying to get away from it. And all of a sudden, he starts snapping at those dogs. Technically, we would correct that, but technically, that's also unfair, mm -hmm. right? Because he goes in and he takes off trying to get away from all the stress, and they keep pursuing him because they're like, hey, who are you? Mm -hmm. So then he feels threatened, mm -hmm. right? So then he starts snapping at him, going, like, hey, back away, you're making me feel uncomfortable, you're scaring me. But aggression is not a healthy response, technically. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, that's where things get tricky. So, um, if it was a smaller group, like three to five dogs, sure, mm -hmm. if he does well there. If I see like, you know, anything more than like eight dogs at the dog park, me personally, I'm not ask too many dogs, because mm -hmm. I'm thinking he's gonna be overwhelmed, you know? So it's like bringing in a quiet person to a party. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're a quiet person, they're an introvert, they don't wanna really be there, right? It makes them uncomfortable. Maybe for this guy, unless the setting is, is, is 
comfortable for him where you can see him run around and be free and stuff like that. He's actually enjoying himself mm -hmm. because it's it's to a degree that he feels comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, questions about that stuff? Um, it's yeah the. You know, you mentioned like he doesn't need the dog park, mm -hmm. and I guess for me, it, you know, it feels right. Like he wants to run and get exercise and play mm -hmm. and all that normal stuff. So if we didn't do the dog park, then how does he get that, or does he? Does he play ball or anything? Um, at home. Does he play fetch? Inside, yeah. I mean, because with the e collar you get off leash control, which means you can take your dog anywhere and not worry about him taking off. And he can run around the park, you know? Um, what does that mean? Like, I mean, what would I do if he just started, like, taking off? I would just... Sure. So, one thing would be we wouldn't or shouldn't even see that because of discipline. Mm -hmm. Okay, so dogs that are undisciplined, you take the leash off. <laughs> there they go. Yeah. Dogs that have rules and boundaries don't do that. Okay, so like my dogs are completely off the street. I can take my dogs anywhere. Mm -hmm. There could be a little plot of land with four busy streets all around it, and I'm not worried. My dogs are kind of on the street. Okay, so the e collar one, if that did happen, we have the ability to bring him back either through recall or stopping the behavior because mm -hmm. it's um, remote collar gives you off leash control. So you don't need the leash in order to communicate with them, it's at the press of a button. Mm -hmm. um, the highest power collar has a one mile range, so plenty of range for the average family pet, okay? Uh, so there's recall. Boundaries in itself would prevent them most likely from even trying to take off. Um, and then if he plays fetch and he likes to play ball or whatever, you can go to like the park and just have him play ball. Or if you find a setting where he can be off leash with other dogs, and oh, uh, he can be off leash with other dogs, and play in a smaller group setting, mm -hmm. or like the friends dog that that to trust their dogs off leash, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it just gives you more options where you don't have to always feel like you have to take them to the dog park. Yeah. Let's say you walk by the dog park and you're like, "There's 20 dogs today. I'm gonna just play fetch with them at the park, mm -hmm. right? Just find yourself a nice little space, play fetch. Mm -hmm. Come back the next day. Oh, only five dogs today. Pop in. Mm -hmm. Don't have to find the dog park. Mm -hmm. It just opens your activities up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for a dog. Um, it's it's hard for people because like he, he he's not sitting at home going I really wish I was at the dog park right now <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. like a human would right mm -hmm. like man I wish I could have gone to that party tonight with my friend but nope gotta work mm -hmm. right dogs don't do that mm -hmm. it just it makes the human feel good mm -hmm. right so like my dogs they used to be super social and play with everyone and you know everything but now they're old they're like eight to nine years old. They're past that. No socialize, no sniff dog and stuff, but they're just not players anymore. Mm -hmm. What they would rather do is I just walk with them to the park, let them be free, and they like to sniff and pee and poop on stuff. <laughs> That's their thing now, mm -hmm. you know? So for him to be happy, he doesn't need the dog park. For him to be happy, in my opinion, is he needs to know the structure, boundaries, rules, uh, the fact that you'll handle things if something happens, that you'll hold them accountable for, but then also he would get to do more things with you because you have this level of control. Mm -hmm. So like my dogs can go anywhere with me. They can go to a restaurant with me. I can take them to the store. I can take them out hiking on a trail. Uh, doesn't matter if there's deer, raccoon, whatever. I can take my dogs anywhere because of the level of control I have. Mm -hmm. So their quality of life is much greater because I, I'm not limited to things, right? Yeah. I did a consultation earlier and their dog lunges at people and, and dogs and they can't take the dog anywhere, and they can't have people over, so they've had to withdraw, right? So I told them, with more control, you'll start to have a, an actual quality of life with your dog because you'll be able to not only stop and deter things, but have the control to take your dog places where you normally would avoid because you have that level, okay? Now everybody's level is different. So, like Some people just wanna walk their dog and go to the park. Some people wanna walk the dog, go to the park, go to restaurants. And some people do all that plus they go hiking, they go to the dog beach, they go to the dog comes home to the friend's house, the dog goes camping with them, right? Tons of stuff. Then they need the most control. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, questions so far? I think you've answered them so far. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the dog park one, I wouldn't 
Because I had another lady, she had a Shiva, and her dog used to love going to the dog park and playing. And then she took him to daycare, and then the daycare overwhelmed him. And then I think he got attacked or got in a fight. And ever since that happened, he wasn't the same at the dog park. So then she's like, yeah, I go to the dog park, and he minds his business, but if a dog tries to sniff, sniff him, he gets aggressive. Right, and she showed me videos, and I was like, so I was like, so you tell me if you take your dog to the dog park, he's fine, but the moment the dog comes up to him, he gets aggressive, and she goes, yes. I go, it sounds to me like your dog's going to go to the dog park. Like, he'll mind his business, but the moment a dog comes into his personal space, he's like, stay out of it, right? So I was like, and unless you're controlling other people's dogs and telling them, like, hey, keep your dog away from my dog, which then makes it unfair to them, like your dog's really not wanting to be at the dog park, you know, but she felt, because it made, again, her feel good that he needed it. And I was like, maybe in the beginning he liked it, but ever since that experience, he's not the same dog anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and then other than that, he was like the laziest dog too. <laughs> like he didn't pull on a leash. He was super chill, was great with people. He was great with dogs that he knew, mm -hmm. no issues with them. It, the only issue was the dog park. And she wanted to take him there because it made her feel good. And I was like, but your dog's not liking it, mm -hmm. you know? So. Uh, there's a bit of there's a number of variables there. Um, not to say it's not an option, but I would just probably avoid it certain times. The running, I wish he, I wish he could just run. Uh, he loves to run, so I was taking him like um, my parents have a tennis court across the street, and mm -hmm. I was when nobody was in the tennis court, I let him just go run, 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 run in the tennis court because he loves to run so much. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to do the off-leash in the park so he could run. Mm -hmm. I haven't done off-leash because I was too afraid of sure. him running so, away. You know, yeah. For sure. So in terms of like length of time, you're at, at minimum at six classes, mm -hmm. and then there's nine and 12 if you want, okay? If you did, decide to do the six, two on heel, two on recall, which leaves classes five and six for like behavioral stuff if you'd like, mm -hmm. okay? I can even cut recall in half and only do one part of it, it's the most important part. The other part is just kind of like uh, an add-on mm -hmm. um, to do more behavioral stuff, right? So if it's like, hey, Jesse, I have a friend who has a dog that you've never met before, and I would like to introduce them correctly. Mm -hmm. I can show you how to do that. Mm -hmm. Once you know how to do it, it's really just repeat, rinse and repeat. That's literally all it is. Because um, it's me teaching you a skill. Obedience is us teaching him a skill, okay? So heal is a skill, walking at your side. Come when called is a skill. Come over here when I call you. But teaching socialization is me teaching you how to socialize them correctly. Dogs already know how to socialize. It's humans that don't don't know how to help them socialize. Okay, so that's usually probably like a class maybe two. The only reason that we might do two classes on it would be if like let's say the first dog we worked with was like a passive female, which would work well, um, and then the next one was like a hyperactive male. Right, you got two different energies. Mm -hmm. So then the process would be the same, but the his responses may be different. Mm -hmm. So then I would teach you like, okay, you know, when this dog has this much energy, this is what you're gonna do. You wanna avoid this, so on and so forth. Uh, so that it, it, it's as positive as possible. Even if something bad happens, we correct it, we work through it. People, when they see something, if they try to socialize their dog and it doesn't go like they hope it will, mm -hmm. they tend to like not want to do it. Mm -hmm. But I tell them, no, you got to correct it and you keep moving forward, otherwise, your dog will never get over this part. Mm -hmm. You know, so we just keep repeating it. But that's what's so uh, good about using a friend's dog or whatever is because you can re the same dog each time, once a week, go for a walk. And then eventually, he's like, all right. We, we, we had a fat, a bad, you know, first meeting, but I've seen you 20 times since then, so it's been fine. Mm -hmm. And then he opens up to them. Kind of like with humans. Mm -hmm. You know, humans, we don't get to become best friends right off the bat. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure it happens, but it takes time. Time and experiences to build trust, right? That you can count on that person. Uh, you know, good times and bad times, right? All that stuff. Same thing goes for dogs as well, mm -hmm. okay? So at minimum, six classes. Um, nine and 12, which is get you more control of obedience wise the only command that has to be off leash reliable is the recall mm -hmm. which is common called um because if it's not a reliable off leash it's kind of pointless yeah. okay uh which 
even though I'm just covering it with you in one class, um, it's really just practicing to get to that point. Okay, recall tends to take the longest for people to get um, to be fully reliable because um, you have to go to the park, put them on a long leash so you can practice recall with them safely and not worry about him running off in the beginning stages. Uh, there's also a number of stages. We go from the short leash to the long leash, uh, to long leash dragging, to no leash enclosed area like a tennis court, to no leash unenclosed area, okay? Because uh, it all comes down to the handler. So like I get clients who within a couple of weeks are already like, yeah, just if we take our dog off leash already, like the dog's great. But their confidence and their control is very high, right? But I get other clients whose dogs are really well trained, but the client themselves doesn't trust the dog. Mm -hmm. So that takes longer because they need more practice, they need more consistency and successes with their dog mm -hmm. before they build their trust and like, okay, I do have control over my dog and they won't run away, mm -hmm. okay? So that's always the variable. Uh, so within the six classes, don't expect your recall is gonna be perfect. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have the skills to do it. You just have to go out and practice it, mm -hmm. okay? And even if you practice every day, like it's still gonna take you a couple of months. Uh, because your obedience is only as good as the environments you practice in and you can only come across so many things within the training session mm -hmm. you know so I always tell my clients to practice in all sorts of weather conditions when it's raining when it's really hot when it's snowing uh, uh, different parks different locations uh, if the dog has prey drive practicing around squirrels and geese uh, raccoons rabbits you know deer if they go to the like the lake house like all these things are things they have to practice around in order to get their uh, recall to be applicable, like no matter what, okay? Uh, which just, just takes time. Uh, other than that, if you did like the nine and 12 class programs, then we just teach more obedience. So heal and, and recall are the two most important ones and the two most important ones that apply to you. Then there's sit, stay, down, and place, uh, which are stationary commands. Down and place allow you to go like to a restaurant with him. So like that there, that little dog bed, like, um, let's say you took like a towel, you went to the restaurant, you popped it down on the ground, you told him to place, you'd go and lay down, and you could have brunch or dinner, and he doesn't move from the area. Mm -hmm. So then he's able to go places like that with you. Uh, but if it's not something you would do with him, then it's not really applicable. Mm -hmm. um, that's where like the nine and 12 classes come into play. Uh, 12 classes is where we build everything towards off-leash reliability, the sit, stay down, come place, heal, all six commands. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes time, time and practice, because you gotta go to the park, practice all that stuff and so you build your confidence of like, okay, cool, I have complete control over my dog. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, for the socialization, would you do any of that here, like you said, with the muzzle and the other dogs here, or how does that work? Yeah, we can, as long as it's muzzle condition. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing, is that um, whenever I talk about socialization, both with humans and dogs, I always tell everybody during the consultation, muzzle condition your dog now. And they almost always don't do it. Okay. <laughs> what does it mean, muzzle condition? Muzzle condition is when you can put the, the muzzle on him, mm -hmm. and it's like a collar. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care. Mm -hmm. uh, because the muzzle takes away dog's primary source of defense, right, which is their mouth, mm -hmm. it can put them under stress. So then we'll have three stressors technically the e collar is a stressor, the muzzle is a stressor, and if we're trying to socialize them with like personalities he doesn't like, that is also a stressor. Okay. So, Ideally, by that point, he's over the e-collar because he's been he's practiced with it enough that he knows or is familiar with what it is that it doesn't freak him out. Uh, the muzzle conditioning is you can use food, uh, so to, to, for him to put it on, so that he is like, oh, okay, when I put this on, like I get like chicken and turkey and bologna, and then you can put it on, he just walks around it with it like no problem. Okay, so this allows us to socialize them safely without the worry of like what if what happens if something happens, mm -hmm. right? Uh, same thing if you're like socializing with a friend. Interesting uh, in, in, uh, with people is that like people will walk up to other people's dogs and pet them with no permission, mm -hmm. but the moment someone says, would you pet my dog, people get suspicious. Because mm -hmm. they're like, why do you want me to pet your dog? Oh, because he's kind of shy with people who are trying to socialize them. And the person's like, mm, your dog's gonna bite me. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it always happens, right? So, um, Muscle conditioning is something, like I said, I would recommend you do now. Um, it's literally muzzle, put the food in the muzzle, he eats from the muzzle, and you keep repeating that. And you gradually build it to where you can clasp it, and then he can walk around with it. You can even take him on a walk with it to get him used to it. So he's like, okay, I sometimes I wear this on walks, sometimes I wear this around the house, sometimes I eat my dinner out of it. 
you know, it just becomes another thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this way, if we get to that point, we're not worried about, you know, if if, if for whatever reason things do go south, mm -hmm. it allows us to correct the behavior and continue moving forward. Okay, uh, other questions. There's uh, two major types. There's mesh muscles, mm -hmm. uh, which we don't use. Uh, they just go around the mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're also called grooming muscles because they're meant to be worn temporarily. Mm -hmm. The style that we use are called basket muscles uh, that are open. He can open his mouth, he can drink water, he can take food, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a basket style, okay. okay? And the brand that we use is Baskerville. You can get them on Amazon for like 25 or 35 bucks, depending on the market. Okay. Um, it's a hard rubber. Uh, we use them here for the dogs that we train, and any dogs, any uh, clients that we work with, we usually just fill in Baskerville. Um, and then, if you ask Maria, hey like, Maria, would you please send me the muzzle videos? She'll send you a link to my website where we have a bunch of like training resources, mm -hmm. and we have videos on muzzle training there. Oh. Uh, we have a couple that we've done ourselves, and then we have some that are from other trainers that we recommend. Okay. okay and then we just tell people to start that process because muzzle conditioning can take a couple of days or it can take a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't know how it's going to work for your dog, but at least by the time we get to the point where we need it, like you've already done something, and it just makes it easier. Okay. Uh, other questions? Um, I don't know right now. It's a lot to take in. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's simple, but it's complicated yeah. because um, people typically think like, you know, food-based training, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work behaviorally. Mm -hmm. Um, so when, when it comes to remote training, it sounds complicated, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, and if you want to get an example of like what that looks like, you go to my YouTube channel. Lesson ones are always great to watch because no one knows what they're doing, and you can see like how that how like the process works and um, um, how we layer in the collar. Okay. Um, other questions? I don't think so right now. Yeah. How much does he weigh? Five fish pounds. Okay, he's pretty solid. Yes. From what I can feel he's here, he's got a lot of muscles. His legs, he's he got some serious leg muscles. Yeah. So um, the call that you would technically need uh, is for thirty-five pound dogs and under. Uh, it runs about two thirty-seven ish with tax. Uh, half mile range, fully waterproof system. Um, and you, and I think I saw he's at the Sanji. Cool, yeah, probably other stuff, but I don't know what. So. You never got him tested or anything? So his, um, when they found him, he was with his brother, mm -hmm. and the owner of the brother got the brother tested. Mm -hmm. um, but they had a pit bull, mm -hmm. and it came back, it was, or no, Frenchie? I think it was a Frenchie. So it came back, was they shared water and everything, so it came back like there was like other weird stuff, and I was like, I wonder if the, the lady's like, I think the Frenchie DNA got in that thing. Sure. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Sure, sure, sure. Because there was like some of it that didn't make any sense, but the Basenji and the Beagle made sense. Um, and I, yeah, that's where I'm like, I don't know what else. Okay. Yeah. Because I see pity. Yeah, I see pit too. Yeah. yeah. Right there in the face, first thing I see is pit. Mm -hmm. So when I deal with any kind of pity or pit mix, my suggestion is always that people go with a higher power collar. Okay? Pities are known for their intensity. Mm -hmm. And the intensity not only in aggression, but like in anything they do. Mm -hmm. If it's anxiety, if it's fear, if it's nervousness, pities tend to be like a little bit more intense about it. Mm -hmm. So like a reactive German Shepherd versus a reactive pity are like two different animals in my book. And I have a pity myself. I love pities. I've trained so many throughout the years. They're definitely uh, more intense than other dogs. Mm -hmm. Is that they're, they're built tough uh, because of the background. Mm -hmm. And so like if with the 35 pound, for the e-collar for his size, technically it's for a dog his size. But I always want to think worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. So our worst case scenario would be like if he did get in a scuffle, mm -hmm. right? Is you may not have enough output on the lower power collar mm -hmm. to stop him in the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
So my suggestion is you go with uh, what's called the Black Edition. It's, um, I think we're talking 330-ish with tax. It's a one mile range, fully waterproof system, uh, but it's meant for 70 pound dogs and over. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the reason why I recommend that one is you don't have to worry about if, you, if there's a bad moment or something, mm -hmm. it's the highest bar collar that's gonna override them. I can use it on my eight pound chihuahua. It's perfectly safe. All it means is you get more from less. Okay, so on your small collar, you could be, let's say, at 80, but on the black edition, it would be like 35. Does that make sense? No, sorry. <laughs> 80 on the small collar uh -huh. would be like the equivalent of 35 on a high power collar. Okay, I'm with you now. Yeah, yeah. so you need, uh, so if you're at 80 and he's not responding, you only have 47 levels left. But if I'm at 35 and he's not responding, I have 90 levels left. Okay, so it gives you a bit more wiggle room there. It's a curved collar, so uh, even though it's a smaller dog, it's not gonna look clunky, because the one in between them is a big box. Uh, and then, I mean, if you don't care about aesthetics, technically that's um, uh, an option as well. That one was about 287 inch with tax. And it's meant for 70 pounds and under. But I'm like, if you're gonna spend more money, you might as well just get the better one and not have to worry about it. What happens if like, things go south? Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing you also want to think about is, let's say he's off the leash and someone goes up like a firework or something mm -hmm. and it spooks him. Now you have to override his flight response, mm -hmm. okay? And that's where output comes in again, okay? And these are all things that I cover within the training. Uh, you know, not just the training, but like things that happen to people and what you want to train for uh, in like kind of emergency situations. Um, so what does it, like how, how long, like he's not gonna wear it forever, right? So that's a good question. So that's the most common question I get, is when does the collar go away? Mm -hmm. When you need it, it doesn't, okay? So the easiest way to explain that would be, um, do you drive? Yes. Do you go on the expressway? Yes. Do you go to the speed limit? Yes. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say that, gonna, that's a no, right? But you see a squad car, what happens? Right, because now there's still the consequence, uh -huh. right? And most people speak, right? That's called opportunistic behavior. So what it means is if you get away with something, you might try it, right? So same thing for dogs, it's, it's uh, all animals have it. So for him, think of the e collar as a cop on a collar, uh -huh. okay? When it's present, he's gonna know there's still the consequence, he's gonna behave differently. So if he's a great dog inside of the house, you don't need it. If he's a great dog at your friend's house, you don't need it. But if it's like, I'm gonna take them off leash at the park, we're gonna go for a walk, we're gonna go to the dog park, you're gonna need it. Cause there's a lot of variables there, okay? Uh, a lot of people will ask like, well, when does a dog learn to be a good dog? That's not a thing, okay? Dogs don't make decisions like that. Humans can. You know, I could say something to someone and hurt their feelings, and I go, man, that sucked. I don't like that I hurt their feelings, and I don't like the way that I felt after I hurt their feelings. I'm not gonna say something like that to get to them, or to a person, I don't wanna better myself that way. Right? That's a human thing. Dogs are reactive. He responds by response to what you give him. So if you're giving him structure and discipline and consequence, he's going to give you that. But unfortunately for us, our means of discipline is external. It's a remote and a collar. His means of discipline is built in. It's right here. Right? So if another dog bit him and corrected him and he respected it, whenever he was around that dog, he would behave. Because that dog that correction is right there. As long as that dog's in the mouth, that dog can correct him. So he's gonna keep himself in check, okay? Whereas for us, we need tools. So that's where things fall short. Uh, it's not because of my skills as a trainer, it's not because of the training methods. If you remove any motivator, performance with steps. So like, let's say, uh, if your job stopped paying you, would you keep doing it? No, you don't have a motivator. And same thing, if there weren't cops and judges and prisons and jails to reinforce the laws, do you think everybody would still listen to the laws? No. So it's the same thing for dogs. Uh, so when it comes to that, it's nothing good or bad. It's not that you're always having to use it, it's just that it's present. And maybe if something happens, maybe a dog comes after him, unprovoked, and he's responding, you're trying to pull him out of there, that's a situation that you just can't control. You still have a means of control because of a remote call. Okay? Uh, other questions? Um, nothing I can think of. Okay, so if anything pops up, you can let us know. Um, if all you're caring about is just the
problem that you have at hand, right? Uh, I would suggest the six class program. Two classes on heal, two classes on recall if we wanted, which leaves us a couple classes for the behavioral stuff. Um, if you find like, hey Jesse, like ever since we started to heal and I've been taking some dog park, he's been like so much better, it can happen. Then I go, okay, then what do you want to cover in classes five and six? Can you teach me how to teach him to sit still so I can take him to the restaurant? Sure, we can cover that, okay? Uh, the only thing that has to happen is heal. That's the one thing that has to happen, and we build everything off of that, okay? Otherwise, uh, 9 and 12 are just if you want more control over him. But 6 is like what I call the walk my dog and go to the park. So you'd be fine with that, okay? Maria would send you the make and models that I suggested. And then uh, you can get them on Amazon and get them through us. I don't care. Um, and then I'm currently booked or booking into July right now. Um, so there's, I had a consultation yesterday, I mean today, early today, I had two yesterday. So like then it's kind of back in line, you know, until uh, she gets to you and she's like, okay, like, you know, where can I put you, whatever. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's pretty much it. Nothing uncommon, nothing that that's seen before. Um, it's just a matter of like what your end goal is. The most complicated one is of course the dog park. That's it. Everything else is actually pretty simple. So I was saying my dog's like, no, should be pretty straightforward. Off these training for the recon stuff, pretty straightforward. It's just practice. Okay? Okay. So I'll go ahead and get this guy set up like we have him. Um, and if anything pops up, you can just let us know. Anything in the meantime, I guess I can do the muzzle and the, should I get a different? Prong collar for now? Uh, yeah, if you want to, I'll have Marie send you the link. The brand that we use is Herm Springer. Uh, um, it's the same size. Not sure. <laughs> that actually happened the other day. Um, Herm Springer, you have the correct size here. And this is fitted too big, by the way. Okay. Does that just happen? Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so different. How do I size it? inside out, yeah. that shouldn't happen either. Yeah. Okay? But this would be fitted correctly, technically. And if anything, and we'll just walk them with this and maybe the flat collar. Oh the more again? I see there. It's probably your best bet so that you can keep the prong on top. Um, it, it, this takes away from this but having this here is, is much better than it was down here clipped to this. But you still have your fail safe in case this were to pop off. That's my fear. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, double clipping in is fine. Um, but the brand that we use is from Springer. Um, and you can get them on Amazon. They're anywhere between fifteen and twenty-five bucks. Uh, it's similar, but it's going to have a chain instead. And you want to stay away from alligator clips. Okay. What's the alligator clip? The it, yeah, it literally looks like an alligator head. Oh, I see. It's a chain of alligator head that clips. You just want a standard Herm Springer prong. Okay. okay, it'll just be like a, those are the, the prongs and then a single chain with the ring. Okay. That's it. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Maria will send me all the other Info. stuff. Correct. And the pricing and all the things for the six session. Correct. Okay. Yeah. She'll send you all the info and all the stuff that I uh, mentioned during the session.